Hello, everyone. I'm Ashri Norodrin, and I'm a social science researcher at the Stanford Department of Emergency Medicine. In this section, we're going to talk about the most common COVID-19 related myths and misinformation. Joining me is Dr. Newberry. Hi, I'm Dr. Newberry, and I'm a faculty member and emergency physician at Stanford University. I'm looking forward to this conversation and helping to clear things up. Let's have a quick chat before we move forward about some important disclaimers. While we will talk a lot about COVID-19, this video series should not be used for personal medical advice. If you're worried about your own health, please talk to your doctor who knows you and your medical needs best. In some videos, we may also talk about legal issues that have come up during the pandemic. Our aim will be to make you aware of these, but once again, you should talk to a lawyer if you have any legal concerns of your own. Another important point to mention is that the information in these videos is the most up-to-date to our knowledge, but keep in mind that good science is always evolving, so we will keep learning more. Yes, great point. And the last final note, none of us have any financial conflicts of interest to declare. We are not making any money on this. Okay, great. Let's get started. We know that there's a lot of different information about COVID-19, healthcare, and the best ways to protect ourselves. Because the pandemic is rapidly evolving, a lot of this information may be wrong or misleading. So our main goal today is to go over some of the most common myths and false information surrounding the COVID-19 pandemic. We will also talk about how to access the most accurate information. Okay, great. So here's my next question for you, Dr. Newberry. We have constantly heard on the news about the number of people affected and dying from COVID-19, but many of us aren't seeing this in our daily lives. Are we sure the pandemic is even real or as bad as people say it is? Yeah, I know it can be so confusing when what you're seeing on the news doesn't match what's happening in your daily life. But sadly, the COVID-19 pandemic is real and has very scary consequences for a lot of people. At the time of this recording, globally, there have been more than 2.8 million deaths caused by this virus. It is sometimes hard to see the impact of COVID-19 because it affects different people in such different ways. Yeah, we definitely need to prevent more COVID-19 deaths. Okay, next question. We've heard a lot about hospitals being overwhelmed with patients, but I've heard that many hospitals actually look empty. On social media, for example, there are many videos going around of completely empty hospitals. And so some people are wondering, where are all the COVID-19 patients? That's a great question. There are two main reasons that hospitals might seem empty. First, patients with any potential COVID-19 symptoms, such as fever or sore throat, are isolated to stop the virus from spreading to others. Visitors to the hospital won't see these isolated patients in plain view. And to prevent the spread of COVID, we let far fewer visitors into the hospital, and sometimes none at all. We also want to protect the privacy of our patients, and so people generally are not allowed to film at hospitals without permission. This is to protect you and your families. If you are a patient, we don't want strangers to hear about your health issues or even know that you're in the hospital without your permission. But please believe us, hospitals have been full of COVID-19 patients. Many hospitals have been overwhelmed and even have had to transfer patients to other hospitals. Oh, I see. So there are a lot of COVID-19 patients in the hospitals, but we can't necessarily see them because they're separated to protect their own privacy and to protect other patients from getting COVID-19. Another common myth is that people who do not have symptoms of COVID-19 can't spread the disease. Is this true? No, and this is a really important point. It's entirely possible for someone to get the virus, not know they have it, and then pass it on to someone else. This is what we call asymptomatic transmission. Asymptomatic transmission is when people catch the virus and pass it on to other people without ever knowing that they were sick. That is, they don't experience any symptoms or are asymptomatic. Some scientists estimate asymptomatic transmission could be responsible for more than half of COVID-19 cases. Often, young people are a source of asymptomatic transmission. They can easily spread the disease, especially because they often experience milder or no symptoms compared to older people. Okay, so we know that people who don't show any symptoms or signs of COVID-19 can still spread the disease but a lot of people think that the virus won't affect them. A common myth is that this virus only affects certain people or certain groups of people. While some people are at higher risk of severe illness, it's really important to realize that this virus can affect anyone. It does not care about your race, ethnicity, age, sex, gender, or anything else. 
Younger adults may think COVID-19 only affects older people. This is not true. Adults of all ages are getting very sick with the virus. Many people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s have been admitted to the intensive care unit with COVID and have died from it. Even young people who recover from the illness might still be exhausted for months, and some people have permanent health problems like damage to their heart or their kidneys. Right, and children aren't completely safe either. Doctors are seeing an illness called multi-system inflammatory syndrome that is associated with COVID-19. We are still learning a lot about this disease, but here's the basic idea. A child contracts the virus and their immune system becomes too active when trying to fight it. This can cause severe damage. There's one more point we want to make. Sadly, we have seen that many Asian people, especially people who are of Chinese heritage, are being bullied or abused because of misinformation and because people are calling the virus the China virus or other wrong and derogatory names. Yes, the virus was first discovered in China, but we want to emphasize that anyone of any ethnicity or race can get the virus. Yeah, I think it's important for all of us to understand that anyone can get the virus and no group is to blame for the pandemic. Okay, next common myth for you, Dr. Newberry. Some people think that COVID-19 will just be like getting a cold. And because of this, they might think some home remedies can treat it. So what's your take on home remedies? Unfortunately, we don't know how to cure COVID-19 right now. And there's no harm in trying most of these home remedies like ginger or purple onion. Also, drinking tea or gargling with lemon and honey might help your throat feel better if you have a cough. But none of these will cure you. The virus is much deeper in your lungs and in other organs where things like food and drink can't get to. Okay, got it. So if you do get sick, it's okay to try these home remedies to treat your symptoms. But if your illness gets worse, it's still important to go to the hospital. And of course, it's still better to avoid getting sick at all because there are no known treatments for the disease. So remember to use that trusty recipe, wear a mask, social distance, and wash your hands often. Exactly. Let's also talk about one dangerous belief going around, the false idea that alcohol can help cure people of the COVID-19 virus. Alcohol cleans things outside of the body, but it does not work the same way inside of us. Even worse, alcohol can actually weaken our immune system and increase our risk of getting sick from the virus. Thank you for that, Dr. Newberry. Another common misunderstanding is that you can't catch the virus from getting together with your family. We understand people want to see their family and close friends, and everyone is doing their best. But family gatherings are not 100% safe and can be a source of virus spread. Here's a way to think about it. You and the people you live with all act as one unit. Let's look at an example. Say you live with your sister, your husband, and your mother. Your sister goes to see a friend, but how does she know whether her friend has been wearing a mask regularly or hanging out with lots of people? She really doesn't. And then what happens if the friend has the virus, but no symptoms? If your sister catches the virus from her, she will then bring it to your home as well. It is the same as if you, your mother, and your husband all went to see your sister's friend as well. Now multiply this by each person in your home. Every time someone in your home goes out, they might bring back the virus. The more people they interact with outside of the home, the higher the chance of catching the virus and bringing it home. So if you go to a gathering with other family members you do not live with, think about how many people they have all been in contact with. Got it. Another myth that I've heard is that you're likely to catch COVID-19 if you go to the hospital. Dr. Newberry, I know you work at the hospital. What's your take? We want people to know that it is safe to go to their doctor or an emergency department. Hospitals are taking so many precautions to keep people safe, including increased cleaning protocols, personal protective equipment like masks, gowns, and gloves for healthcare workers, and limiting visitors. It is very unlikely that you will catch the coronavirus by going to the hospital because they are being so cautious. So for now, just remember, it's safe to get help. Okay, that's really good to know. So we learned a lot about the different myths and false information circulating about the COVID-19 pandemic. How can we be sure to access and use the right information? Yes, it's difficult to figure out what to believe when there are so many different sources of information from social media to WhatsApp to various news sources. We have two main recommendations to help you access the most accurate information that is up to date. First, we recommend searching online for public health organizations, such as the Center for Disease Control or your state or county public health department. You can also use the World Health Organization. Second, for more specific or personalized advice, we recommend speaking to your own physician. 
Thanks so much, Dr. Newberry. So do you have any advice for how to try to stop the spread of misinformation in our community or even amongst family members and friends? Sometimes my own uncle sends inaccurate information on WhatsApp into the family group chat and everyone gets so confused about what to believe. I think it's important to remain respectful and caring, but also to follow up with accurate information when you recognize misinformation. So in your situation, I would send a message with the correct information and a trusted public health source into the family group chat. You could also follow up with your uncle directly in a respectful way so that he does not forward the false facts on elsewhere. Yeah, that could be a tricky conversation, but I can see that in the long run, it's important to protect our communities from misinformation that could potentially be harmful. That makes a lot of sense to me. Thanks so much, Dr. Newberry. And that's all we have for this session. Please remember to try to correct misinformation when you can and check all of your sources of information. Thank you.